Uh, my name is Khalil. <laughs> begin our uh, sorry we will now begin our journal club presentations uh we'll start with our first intern mr david kim he has his master's and he's from the arkansas college of osteopathic medicine so david whenever you want uh you could share your screen um so i that's Wow. Um, it says I have to quit and reopen to connect, so I'll join. I'll be right back. Sorry about that. That's fine. Here, in the meantime, we'll have our next presenter, Mr. Sagar Singh. from St. Louis Community College and Francis Howard North High School. Uh, would you like to share your screen, uh, Sagar? Yes. Awesome. All right, I've now shared the screen. Um, I hope everyone can see this. Um, hello everyone, my name is Sagar Singh and I'm currently in high uh, a high schooler in the early college programs of St. Louis Community College and the University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy in St. Louis. Um, for the first lecture series of uh, week one journal club i'll be presenting i'll be showcasing an article titled video based technical feedback and instruction and uh, how it improves tackling technique of community rugby <clears throat> games. Um, below listed are the affiliations of the authors and this is a article from the european journal of sports sciences So um, to give a little background regarding this um, article, firstly, the, the aims of this uh, journal article were firstly to test the, uh, the change of uh, player tackling technique after video-based uh, technical feedback. Um, and essentially, uh, yeah, the purpose of this article was to di discuss the uh, effectiveness of this method of video-based technical feedback to in order to optimize Um, tackle training for player safety and performance. Um, and then lastly, one of the aims was to essentially add more to the literature um, of the gaps in um, knowledge regarding rugby athletes and surrounding the facets of tackle safety and tackle technique. Um, now for the uh, actual data collection part of the study, the, firstly, this was a non-randomized control intervention study, and it had 24 rugby union players. Um, half were put into a uh, control group of no sort of video-based uh, technical feedback, and uh, the other half were put into a, uh, into a group with video-based um, technical feedback. And so over in total, uh, they had these three sessions of baseline uh, intervention and retention, each separated by one week. And these participants performed six tackles, three tackles on the dominant shoulder and three tackles on the non-dominant shoulder in a tackle simulation. And in total, the data had 432 tackles, 216 composing of the control group and 216 composing of the um, of the group with the video-based feedback. Uh, and each tackle, they were, each each of these tackles were analyzed using a standard standardized list of technical rugby criteria. Um, and uh, they were given arbitrary units. Um, and uh, for the results of this study, um, what they found was that tackling technique from the baseline session to the intervention session um, found that uh, For the uh, non-dominant shoulder tackle data set, uh, only the video-based um, technical feedback group actually improved technique from the baseline phase to the intervention phase of the study. And um, the second, uh, the second, um, the second bullet point there on the um, slide shows that for the um, for the retention session, video-based uh, video-based scoring significantly were significantly higher than the Um, control group for both the data sets that included um, dominant shoulder tackles and non-dominant shoulder tackles. And the results of this study helped properly demonstrate uh, 
how useful these video-based feedback is as a method to try to optimize tackle training to essentially prevent uh, player injury. And so um, when we look at the uh, real world applications of this article, what we see is that uh, the video-based technical feedback group, they continue to actually improve after a retention interval of one week. And they showed a significant improvement from the baseline for two specific tackling techniques, namely body position upright to low and drive through contact with legs and shoulders. And uh, uh, th those are my references and listed below are my academic affiliations. Um, and if anyone would like to add anything and I have the uh, floor open for any sort of questioning or comments. Uh, I have a question, if you don't mind. Uh, you said only the video-based group had significant improvement. Could you uh, explain why? Sorry. Uh, so um, the statistical methods uh, that, they, uh, that they used um, showed uh, that uh, the results were statistically significant when comparing um, uh, when comparing the uh, the results of the arbitrary units compared to the uh, uh, group that had those uh, the video feedback versus the group that didn't. Um, and while uh, you may uh, you may see some variation, these specific results were statistically significant. So that's how they deduced that conclusion in this article. So it's really because they were able to get the feedback that they were able to improve? Yes, based on the statistical results. Okay, thank you. I had a question. Um, so I was unable to read the whole article because like I didn't have access, but based off the abstract, um, when they basically tried to um, get like the, I guess like, was there like a standard criteria that they used to judge like uh, tackling technique and was did they like uh base it off of specific individuals? Yes. How did they rate that? Um, so uh, there wasn't actually uh, much information given within this uh, article regarding the actual units used for it, which is a um sort of limitation of the article study. But um, they essentially use the uh, technical criteria for what a good tackle is in um rugby games and. Um, they had their own rating system that was, uh, they had their own rating system that they fit properly in order to do an effective statistical analysis. Thank you. My name is Patrick. Um, thanks to Dr. Lopez for, for jumping on. I will turn my camera on. I just, uh, I don't look as, as nice as all of you in the current moment. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Quick question would just be as far as the, the one week retention, uh, really interesting results, of course. Um, but just to clarify prior to my question, I suppose would be that retention was not necessarily in a true match or in a true training. It was in another simulated situation. Is that correct? Yes. So it was a study designed by the, um, by the authors of this article. So I guess that would be another limitation of the article in terms of not doing it in a real setting uh, instead of doing it in a simulation. I mean, doing it in a simulation compared to a real setting. Yeah. And I'm just curious kind of on your own um, opinion or supported opinion from maybe any other articles that referred uh, from this one um, around, do you think that these results from this similar intervention would carry over to match play tackle technique? Thank you. Um, I, I would I would um, definitely believe so, uh, just because um, um, while there may be some sort of some variation in terms of uh, uh, in tackle simulation and uh, match play, I do think that these uh, results would translate over um, in terms of that study, in terms of my own personal opinion. Thank you. Well done again. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions? All right, if not, we'll move back to you, David Kim. Uh, are you all set there? Uh, hopefully, let me try sharing my screen. Let's see. That work? That work can you make it full screen. 
Yes, sir. No okay. presenter mode. Can, All right, sweet. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> um, so my paper was, uh, oh, first of all, uh, I'm David. Uh, I attend the Arkansas College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, my paper was uh, based off of uh, examining whether or not um, basically video games should be incorporated into traditional educational settings in uh, teaching, and specifically this case, uh, rugby. <clears throat> Um, so basically, uh, the writers of this paper understood that the video game industry is a huge market and they were asking the question, should game, uh, should games be integrated into the classroom setting or in any traditional educational setting? Um, <clears throat> and they, uh, cited some studies where, uh, it started back in the 1970s where like games were used to teach like history classes. Um, so they basically created this study to address two goals. Uh, the first goal was to determine if traditional instruction is more effective than playing sedentary sport video games and learning a new sport. And the second question was <clears throat> to determine if um, playing these games will stimulate interest in watching or playing rugby in the future. Uh, the reason why they decided to ask these questions was based off of previous studies that were done uh, that were talked about in the paper where there um, a lot of the results for previous studies were inconclusive, but um, some studies did show that uh, these video games could possibly uh, induce interest in either uh, watching or playing the game in the future. Um, so in order to address these goals, um, they did a mixed methods multi-phase intervention with two quasi-experimental groups. Uh, basically what that means is they did a qualitative and quantitative analysis. Um, and this was not a randomized study. Um, in comparison to usual the double randomized studies that you see. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> basically uh, the table on the right kind of just shows uh, how they carried out these uh, this test. Uh, the first day they basically, uh, they recruited people and um, this was a very small sample size of 38 uh, where 19 people were in each group where they decided to either do inst traditional instruction first before playing the game or uh, doing the game first before doing the traditional instruction. Um, so the first day they basically did the survey and they collected demographic information. And then um, depending on which group you were in, um, they either did instruction for two days and then they did the video game sessions for two days. And then after that, all, all the sessions were done, they would have like a focus group where they discussed like the qualitative aspect. Um, so basically what they found was <clears throat> the quantitative analysis, they used a bunch of uh, tests like uh, the, I can't remember the name, it was like Wil Wilkie Bakes, sorry, like I wrote it in my notes, but um, but they basically uh, used a bunch of uh, tests to determine whether the results were statistically significant. Um, and they found that the game, the group that did the game first uh, had significant increases from the pre-test to post-test uh, so basically what they did was they, uh, they had, uh, administered an exam and it, it was an exam of multiple choice questions where it assessed your knowledge of the game and to make sure that there was no bias, uh, they basically did, uh, the survey to assess your knowledge of the game beforehand and to see, uh, if you were interested in rugby and, uh, the quantitative analysis showed that, uh, the group that did the game first had a significant increase from the pre-test to the post-test. Um, overall, but then the other group, the instruction group, did not. But when they broke it down to uh, subset categories where do you know rugby based off the rules, the terminology, positions, field layout, and umpire signals, they found out that most of the uh, increase was from the rule category. And regarding the terminology category, both groups actually did show significant increases uh, in knowledge. <clears throat> Uh, and then uh, regarding the quality of analysis, um, players, uh, this is basically when um, they were uh, asking the players questions and they use some kind of software to uh, like tabulate that data to see if it was significant or not. But the players uh, basically uh, gave their input on what, what they felt uh, was more useful or whether they uh, believed that this would help them influence uh, in playing rugby in the future. Um, and they said that uh, most of the participants ended up saying that um, the game, although it motivated them to watch, it didn't motivate them to play rugby. 
Um, so pretty much universally, all the participants agreed that the game enhanced the rugby knowledge, but that augmentation with instruction is also required. Uh, the reason for that is they believed that there was utility in both methods of instruction. Um, so there was pros and cons of both methods. Uh, regarding the video game, uh, for example, uh, players felt that because they weren't actually on the receiving end of the violent nature of the game, uh, they were more prone to uh, focus. And um, they also stated that it gave uh, playing a video game gave them more insight onto like positioning and like strategizing in the game. But they also agreed that traditional method of instruction was important for the actual like hand-eye coordination, running drills, and enhancing passing skills. Um, so what they weren't um, they were divided on was uh, basically like interestingly the group that played the game first stated that they believed that the traditional instruction should come first, but then the group that did the traditional instruction first believed that the game should come first. But they did both agree that uh, both is required. Um, there were several limitations to this study. Uh, one was the small sample size. Um, another one was the fact that the video game was limited to that one specific game that was chosen. And they weren't sure if that game would be able to accurately represent uh, all of that rugby entails. Um, there was also some like outside factors that they uh, discussed, but they didn't factor into the study, such as uh, cognitive load theory, where basically uh, they were saying like people uh, when they play video games they're um, if you're not as in tune with video game controls you would focus a lot of time like uh, learning the controls instead of focusing on the game for example so they didn't uh, put those things into the equation um, but overall uh, because of the significant uh, increase in certain aspects uh, incorporating video games and incorporating traditional instruction the authors recommended that although feature study is needed, they think that video games are a valuable um, part of also the education process and that uh, both could be used in the future to teach uh, rugby. And I think that is it. And this is the reference, the article that I used and uh, any questions? Hi, I have one. Um, I am just curious on who the participants were like, how old were they? Did they were they athletic? Like, did they have a background in athletics? Um, how was that involved in the study? <clears throat> uh, so the participants they chose, um, they were part of a course, like a one credit course at a college, and um, it was basically like a a video game course. And the participants knew beforehand that there was going to be uh, a study involving rugby. So I forgot to mention, but they also believe that that might have possibly skewed the results in uh, when they answered the question where they were like, oh, it might have motivated me not to play rugby, but just watch because they already knew that it involved rugby and it, it wasn't randomized. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, quick question. Was anybody already familiar with the uh, game rugby or with the rules uh, excluded from this data or were they also included? So uh, they did like a pre-test survey and um, basically most people they did, they knew that what the game was, but they weren't completely familiar with it. So they, they heard about it, but they didn't know like the rules and they weren't familiar with how the game was played to ensure like an even playing field to, and make sure everyone's at the same starting point. So everyone gave, uh, so everyone came in at like relatively the same threshold, uh, knowing um, almost nothing about rugby. Yeah. So they knew it's like they just knew the sport existed, but they didn't. They weren't familiar with how to play the rules and all that stuff. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Any other questions? Yeah, I got a couple of questions, but uh, uh, more comments than anything. I mm -hmm. think uh, there's a very unique article. I think also the. Um, exposure and not only that the growth of e-gaming overall and um its impact is providing some type of educational component uh i think that it's very unique that the authors attempted to try to uh, quantify this or to try to even evaluate whether it's impact 
in an actual sport of, um, I guess, a collision contact, you know, running sport would be viable. But this has been done in history. Um, anyone uh, have an idea of uh, what sport it's been the most impactful in? Is it like football, American football? Yeah. Uh, Snooker, no. sir? Nope. Pat, Please. you think you have an idea you came online? One sport jumps out. I haven't heard this answer before, but Formula One or race car driving in some sense would probably... Correct. Formula One. Turismo. Who influenced Lewis Hamilton, the number one race car driver who just went past Schumacher. Um, 2016, I think, it was like, I guess, what were those magazines? Engadget, right? Those are big uh, video computer gaming ma magazines. that a big article on how Lewis Hamilton jumped from a teenager to the Formula One racing circuit just by playing Turismo. Turismo um, and I be do believe Forza was just coming out at the time. This is prior to the new games that are out and probably even more technically accurate than the previous ones. But um, for him to surpass uh, or him for him to be a big, big advocate for e-gaming. Um, and again, this is just an article I read. It may I don't know how true or valid it is, but I do believe there is some validity in it. Um, I know for a fact uh, we play um, Nintendo Sports Golf with my kids on choosing which club and distances to use. Uh, Dr. Lopez, you muted yourself. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, yes, I didn't mean to mute myself. Um, so I think in the big picture, they not only do it shows them how to use the clubs, the distances, evaluating the dog legs, evaluating the, uh, you know, cars. Evalu I think there's some val validity to it. But I, again, I do think as the authors did state, and maybe even, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Hamilton agree, may this may not apply or may actually work with every type of sport. But it's very interesting in the, nonetheless, and I think the article was a great choice for this uh, first top off here of the uh, lecture series. All right, does anybody else have any questions for David? All right, if not, we're gonna transition into uh, Vladimir. We have our final presenter, Mr. Vladimir Versenin from Coney Island Prepped High School. Uh, can you please share your screen, Vladimir? Uh, of course. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Vladimir. Um, so it's just very interesting being on the receiving end of this. Um, so today we'll be talking about the uh, influence of of playing services on match injury risk in men professional rugby. And mo this article was uh, done through studies between 2013 and 2019, mainly by Charlotte M. Robinson, Sheena Williams, Shepard, Shepard W. West, and all that were mentioned, all that are written. Um, Something important to know, some important background information and methods are that uh, Professional Rugby Injuries, Injury Surveillance Project, or PRISAP, has been, was in charge for collecting data mostly on on your, the European side, also a bit on the American side, on the domestic front. Um, the main point of this uh, study was to examine both uh, Examine injury patterns in different on different services such as uh, artificial, real, and uh, mixed. 
compare the in injury incident severity and burden between the artificial and natural services, where uh, severity, where it's a very good thing to mention, was severity and burden. Where severity usually they looked at how bad the injury is. Some examples is if it caused only bruising or caused damage to the skin. Well, burden looked on more long-term effects, such as effects on walking and posture, as well as analyze outcomes in domestic competition data between artificial, hybrid, and artificial, hybrid, and natural sur surfaces. The data was collected between six seasons, season worth of injury data on male rugby players from England, and compared match match injuries on artificial, hybrid, and natural grass surfaces, and analyzed injuries, incident severity, and burden. The results of European data were that injury rates were similar on different playing surfaces, as it, I expect, but they expected a higher rate of of lower leg, ten, leg and tendon issues on more natural and hybrid surfaces, as well as artificial surfaces were found to be have significantly greater severity injuries for hips, groins, foot, and toe injuries, and neck and crevice spine compared to natural hybrid surfaces. Injury burden was significantly greater on artificial surfaces for poster for the posterior tie, hip, and toe foot injuries. As we can see, one thing the data on Europe was seen as they grouped natural and hybrid all in uh, one category, which has, which I believe have, they've uh, mixed uh, artificial and hybrid all in one category, which has shown not as much as of a focus on the data as possible. Though, though it has put in some lookout points to, if this data were to be recreated again, as it was during the domestic data. Or again, we saw no significant, no significant relationship or changes between how often the injuries happened on either type of surface and the players were found to be to be on. However, artificial surfaces have seen our average duration for recovery, such as on average it was 35 days for recovering from fully from an, from an injury, compared to a natural surface is 28 days, while a hybrid surface is in between 31. Artificial surfaces also had a overall burden, burden of injuries compared to both had a higher burden of injuries overall that we saw both to hybrid and natural surfaces, which uh, which from my analysis of the article most likely came from, from the type of ground of impact, as well as uh, as well as they this time in domestic data, they separated all types of turf to equally represent the type of data that that has come has come for us to see. And uh, as uh, better looking at this graph, we see a more uh, more even split between how the surfaces enact on injuries and how long it takes takes for athletes to fully recover from them. As we see that um, while uh, natural while natural surfaces still still take a while to recover from, there is a possibility for artificial surfaces to cause a greater amount of recovery to be needed. Though something I like to point out is that hybrid services have shown a possibility to be less impactful towards a uh, less impactful on the injuries that the athlete has received compared to natural ones, which which was uh, interesting due to how it was represented on European data. As uh, it shows more of an interest, as it shows more of um, more of a correlation between the two datas and how more specific, more specific we are able to get with it. Um, so influence on of players of 
playing surface on injuries showed that no significant injuries happened between this. No significant injury rate changes have happened between the playing surfaces. And it, both consistently found that both this is both consistently found on professional and amateur levels. And difference between uh, mean and severity burns has shown that the mean severity and burden injuries were vary between playing surfaces, as well as the artificial surfaces are associated with higher mean of severity and injury compared to natural and hybrid surfaces. And this is my this is my source. Any questions? I have one. Um, so if the incidence rate is not really uh, significant uh, between the turfs, but then the severity of injury is, and that's based off like how long the player was out and such, uh, did they attempt to factor in like different physician interpretations? Because um, one physician could say, oh, this guy got this injury, he needs to be out this long versus another physician could be like, I think he needs to be out longer. Uh, did they try to factor that into uh, the analysis? Um, I believe, I believe that it was definitely factored in to a certain extent. As uh, as definitely you wouldn't want a person whose mainly main job is to catch the ball to have a hand injury and not be able to perform his job fully. While as well as you won't want a person whose main job is to main job is to get the ball up the field to have a uh, a leg injury. So I believe it's a mix of both as a, as some players might be on, out for a, a bit longer due to certain roles that they have to fulfill for, fulfill for uh, their position, as well as like what role they play on, on the team in general. Thank you. No problem. Any else? Um, I have one. Um... Did they mention were there like certain specific injuries that occurred more often? Um, because I think was it specific in like European um studies or in domestic studies? Did they mention um any specific injuries that happened um more often than others? Uh, of course. Um they saw the mostly injuries happening below the knee were the most common. Due to, due to either falling underground or being, or being in contact with this with uh, the rough surface, the rough artificial surface, um, that was the most common. Though, has there has been shown that uh, injuries to other parts of the body, such as uh, such as hips or backs, due to being tackled, also also have been like a lot harder to recover from when hitting artificial turf rather than natural. Which I believe was, I believe from both playing on natural and artificial turf, happens due to artificial turf being a lot more sturdier than, than hitting actual like ground that's ready to play on. Um, I have one more question, just per, a personal one, just uh, related to this. Um, since you have had experience on both um, kinds of um, playing field. Which one uh, would sorry, can can you repeat that again? My internet cut out for a moment. Sorry. Um, so I, this was just more personal about you. Um, since you have both experience on artificial and natural playing field, which do you find um you had, you know, I don't know if you had any injuries, but you had more injuries or it was tougher for you to play. Like which one personally do you think? Um personally, I usually played more on artificial services. Though I when switching to a natural surface, it definitely felt a bit more harder to adjust. Though, like due to movement and how the ground feels completely different from when you're playing on uh, on turf. Though after a while, like I saw that definitely you feel a change. But I saw it definitely when I went for a slide tackle or I got to hit and fell on the ground. There hasn't been. It hasn't been that much of an impact. More of the cause was maybe the occasional bruise while I was when I was playing on a turf. Also, it depends on which 
stadium you're playing at or a field because some turf I once did a slide tackle and from um from near my ankle up to my shit up to my knee I uh, had this like big gash where I just ripped off most of my skin though on others where I saw I impacted the ground with my knee and all it caused was a bit a couple of scrapes interesting thank you no problem any other questions? So uh, in the article, uh, in conclusion, they didn't really describe the difference between forwards and backs, did they? Uh, they haven't. From what I read, they haven't really described. Correct. They just looked over the fields and in general. So to clarify to everyone, obviously, yes, the sport doesn't care, entail positional running variations between positions. <clears throat> but overall, everyone's predominantly running in the sport of rugby. Um, so I guess that's why they were looking at it and I guess to to limit the amount of, uh, I guess, uh, to make it more valid, they looked at uh, overall um, just the conditions of the field. <clears throat> but uh, very unique. I think, uh, you know, looking at this, uh, the Rugby Science of Bath group is always coming out with very unique uh, talks. Um, but again, uh, we can't talk about position. We can't talk about play at all because, unfortunately, the scientists didn't look at that aspect of it. But that's very unique in the aspect for them to probably take this to the next stage of their analyses. And I'm assuming Miss Charlotte Robertson will be uh, addressing that with her PhD probably. Uh, I agree, Dr. Lopez, that this is definitely, definitely position should look at this as... Um, I know how well it translates, but from time playing soccer, I definitely know that uh, people who are more at the front of the, like strikers and wingers, usually don't spend that much time with the contact and with the ground doing, uh, or being in more physical, or more, in more physical situations. And it'll be really good to see how that, how recovery changes or how that graph like. Perhaps maybe we get two graphs based on positioning and activity as well. Sure. Uh, great. Great talk. Thank you for that, man. No problem. Any other questions? All right. If that's it, we're going to conclude our Journal Club presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we will now move on to our education series. Uh, please uh, shut off the conference call, please. Thank you so much. And thank everyone for joining. Do you thank everyone for joining us on the conference call, Lucas? No, I'm sorry. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, for no worry joining. about it. It's all good. Listen, you're uh, phenomenal. Great job for the first week of the summer lecture series, everyone.